<laughs> okay, so uh, today is lecture 7 of this complex analysis course and now we will continue with integration. So we have studied many things in the first six lectures. Uh, last time we studied Mobius transforms, which are such things, which is important. And now we will really go into the details of all these classical theorems about the local properties of holomorphic functions. Because so far, really, the only thing we know about holomorphic functions is to tell if a function is holomorphic, essentially, with Cauchy-Riemann. And, I mean, we know a few more things. We know power series are holomorphic, and we know elementary functions that are holomorphic, and we know how to define these using branch cuts. But what are the finer properties, the deeper properties of holomorphic functions? So for this, we need integration, and so we're going to unleash this sequence of, of many results with many properties of holomorphic functions that all have very famous names, like uh, Cauchy's for integral formula, Cauchy's theorem, Molière's theorem, Liouville, etc., 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 okay? Many of these names that you have heard. And, uh, yes, so I know that essentially everyone took already some course, so I will, of course, state my results properly, but I will focus maybe even more on, you know, just the idea of the proofs and sort of what is really going on. Why do we get these, these results? So let me just uh, remind you, so we were, we were dealing with fact integrals. Okay, so we had uh, some f of a homomorphic function on some open set, uh, u. Okay, I think I used a for the first part of the course, now I changed to u apparently, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so f homomorphic on this u, and then you have some path, which is so the path, you remember, is not the same as its image, but the path is a map <coughs> with a parametrization. So a map from A to B into U, which sends T to gamma of T. Okay, so you have such a, such a path, and it could be, could be closed, or it could be open, and what's important is that it has some kind of orientation. Right? So we put this arrow to indicate in what direction we're going, and the value of the integral will change depending on if we go this way or this way. Okay? Right? It doesn't depend on how fast we go in each direction. Okay? So we have such a thing, and then we have the definition of the integral. So by definition, by definition, we have that the integral along this uh, gamma here of f of z dz, so a function defined on an open neighborhood of, of this curve. This was equal to integral from a to b of f of gamma of t times gamma prime of t dt. Okay, so this is what we said last time, and then we gave this, uh, these examples that were enlightening. So the first example was that if we took f of z equal to 1 over z and u is C star, so C star will always mean C, remove the origin, okay? Uh, gamma of T was this circle, R e to I T, which is from 0 to 5, okay, so it's a circle, separated the origin, separated the R. Then what you got was that integral of F of Z, dz was equal to integral from 0 to 2 pi, of, okay, so 1 over gamma, 1 over this, right, because this is f of gamma of t, r e t i t, and times i r e t i t, so this is gamma prime of t, dt, which was integral from 0 to 2 pi of i, dt, which was 2 pi i. Okay, so we recall this, and this was not 0, <coughs> okay, so we will discuss in a minute why. The second example that I want to put is about when these integrals are zero. Okay. So they are zero, so if if you have a primitive essentially. So if f, so if this is analytic, but homomorphic, so it means the same thing, so we keep the same word. Okay, and f is now the derivative, so little f is derivative of big F. So big F is the primitive, this is F, so on U, so for every point in U, this is true, then the integral of gamma, so 
gamma is now any um, well, it's any path actually. So it's gamma is this now, <coughs> okay? So gamma is this. Then this thing is integral of a b of um, so f of gamma of t gamma prime of t of t, which is equal to which is equal to what? Okay. So this is equal to so first, if we want, I can rewrite this as f of gamma of t, I write it like this, okay? Uh, so this is equal to the integral from a to b, and this is the t uh, observation. So what is this actually? So f of gamma of t times gamma prime of t. Yeah, so if you think of a chain rule for differentiating functions, then this is one side of the chain rule, right? So this is the derivative of what function? Capital F of gamma. Exactly. So this is equal to F and gamma prime of T dt. Okay? And now, so we had already said that if you integrate a derivative like this, then you can use the ordinary methods. You have a primitive, right? So then this is equal to F of T minus f of a, okay? In the usual way, that's your use, uh, yeah. Thank you. f of gamma of b minus f of gamma of a. Thank you. So it is equal to this. And it means in particular that if gamma is a closed path, so if gamma of a is equal to gamma of b, then this is always zero, provided that what function you integrate has a primitive. It's the derivative of an analytic function, then actually you can always do it. And we will learn, so this is a sort of step-by-step -step process, okay? So we're discovering all these principles or these properties from, from the start. So what we don't know yet is that actually we will show later that if you have a primitive that is holomorphic, so if you have a derivative of holomorphic function, then you are in fact yourself holomorphic. So if you are holomorphic, then in the entire domain of you, then this kind of thing always holds. You have a primitive. So we will see this. But, uh, but for now we have it. Yes. This formula tells us like the, like the integral of f is is dependent only on the on geometric <coughs> object. So when we see the curve of geometric, it not depends on the parameterization that we choose. Yeah, it does not depend on parameterization. Because here is Actually, only on the endpoints. End points of yeah. the curve. Only endpoints of the curve. Okay. So, yeah, it doesn't matter which way you go, it's yeah. the same. Okay? So, this is clear. So, first, a corollary. So, if gamma is closed, so this means that gamma of A is equal to gamma of B. Then the integral of gamma f to b is equal to zero. Okay? So this we know. Um, now a question. Um, so if you look at example one, what can you say about um, antiderivatives of this function f of b equals one over z? So antiderivatives, primitives, okay, these are two ways of saying the same thing, of this function of the equals one over z. Okay? What can we say about about this using the well both these examples actually, if we put it together? What exists under this? It's not holomorphic. It's not what? Right? It's not holomorphic. Yeah, so what we can say is that Okay, so for sure, so if we look at example two, so assuming that this function had a, an antiderivative, let's assume there is a holomorphic function whose derivative is this, so everywhere on, on the complex plane, right? If that was true, <coughs> then, you know, this integral should be zero yeah. along closed curves, but it's not. So what it means is that, uh, so answer, so there is no, 
analytic function, polymorphic function, polymorphic function f on on C star with f prime of z is equal to to one over z. Okay, so there is no such polymorphic function. And is this consistent with what we had learned when we were discussing the logarithm? So, of course, what would we expect to be the antiderivative of 1 over z? We would expect it to be the logarithm, right? So, locally, this is true. But what this is saying is that there is no function defined on all of c star. So, c star is this, you remove this point, okay? So, there is no function defined on all of this whose derivative is 1 over z. However, we know many functions defined almost on all of this, right? So if I remove just a little bit more, I remove all of this, then I get the function, the principal branch of the logarithm, whose derivative is exactly this. But I have to remove some more points. Because otherwise, I could take a curve that goes all the way around, and the integral will be 2 pi i. If I take away the whole thing, then I have no room to take a curve that goes around the origin, right? Because no. I'm not allowed to pass through this forbidden cut because it's outside of my domain. Yes? But still, if we take, for example, the point different from zero but still negative, a negative line, we can find the derivative, which is not just the, the logarithm as we define it. Absolutely, yeah. So, we can yeah, so if you want, uh, if you want uh, a primitive yeah. to uh, something lying here yeah. on the negative real line, then you can take another logarithm, just not the principal one. You can remove, for example, this line. Yeah. Or so, another. so the problem is only in zero. So yeah, so in some sense the problem is always in zero. The problem is you cannot the problem is you can define a primitive to this using any logarithm by any branch cut, yeah. but you cannot allow it on a domain where you can take a curve that goes all the way around zero. Yeah. This is the problem. And this is also the reason why in fact you don't even have to remove a straight line, you can remove essentially anything. You could remove this if you want as long as it stops you from going around. Okay. And so if somebody asks you some silly question, which nobody ever asks you, but like, why can I not remove just uh, some part of this, but I stop here? Well, you say, well, I can just take a curve of those around. So I have to remove yeah. the whole thing. I mean, you understand why we need to yeah. remove the entire axis up to infinity. Because otherwise it would violate this recombination of these two, two examples. If it was holomorphic, it had to be zero, but it's not. If you can take a closed curve, it goes around zero. Okay, um, good. So let me let me write that. So okay, but have such a function on, for example, C. If I remove minus infinity zero, and this is the principal branch of the logarithm. Okay, so this is the principal branch. Okay, good. That's that. Okay, but so, okay, before I erase, so let's look at this thing. So I have this, um, this curve going around here, and it became 2 pi i. Okay? So we should remember this. Because this is related actually to the number of, of turns that this circle makes around, around 0. <coughs> so what I'm saying is that by generalizing this example 1, we are led to the notion of uh, winding number. Okay? So uh, the example 1 leads to the notion of winding number. And winding number means simply the number of turns that a curve makes around a given point. Okay? So you will see what it means. Hopefully so I will explain. So you have gamma from, okay, let's now take AB to be 0, 1. And to C star, T to gamma of T, uh, defined to E to be 2 pi I N T. Where n is in z. Okay, so let's say I take this. So I take n to be 7, 
for any any integer, okay? So how many times so what is this path actually? So if we draw it. So here we are. So this is of course always on the unit circle. Okay? So if I take n to be equal to 1, this would be simply this path. Okay? We can it both ways. But what would happen if I took n equals 2? Then it would go around once more. Okay? And if I take n equals 3, it would go around 3 times. And if it's n equals 4, it would go around 4 times, and so forth. Okay? But let's compute now the integral of this over 1 over z. So, gamma prime of t is equal to um, 2 pi i n equal to 2 pi i n t. So this integral along with gamma of 1 over z dz, this is then equal to, um, so it's equal to uh, the integral over, so gamma of t was this, so I take 1 over e to the t pi i and t, and then I multiply by t pi i n e to the t pi i and t, okay, and then I can cancel this out, and I get the that I put up, okay, so then this is equal to, so this is from 0 to 1, that's my parameterization, right? So then this is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 pi i n dt, which is equal to 2 pi i n. Okay? So in other words, um, and this, so in other words, this integral, n, so I will call it by this name. If I look at the integral 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over this gamma of the z over z, sorry. Okay? So if I look at this integral, uh, okay, let me forget this name for just one second. I will give you a formal definition soon. So, okay, the implication is that if I divide this out by 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over gamma of this 1 over z dz, then this is equal to equal to n, which is equal to the number of turns around around zero. Um, so we just have to be, be careful about what what direction. So I think this is supposed to be clockwise, uh, actually, that we are we are doing this. So now it feels like it went counterclockwise. Um, so maybe I should have put, yeah, maybe it's minus n that I wanted. Okay. Um, what what is your view on this? Okay. Is this this is going counterclockwise, right? It's going counterclockwise. So maybe this should have been minus. Should have been minus. Okay, so anyway, up, up to a sign. Let me, let me do this. So you can clearly see that this is the number of turns around zero that it does. Right? Then we just have to keep track if it goes in this direction or the other direction. And if every time it goes back, then, so if it goes like this and then it goes back in the other direction, then you, n will become lower again. Yeah. So it will go, it will go back and forth. Yeah, I'm sorry about this, uh, this sign. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's the number of turns around zero, and this will be called the winding number. Okay. This winding number that will give a formal definition now. And actually, so what you want is to count just geometrically the number of turns that you take. But the formal definition, um, so formally. For A, not in the image of gamma. So why do I write image of gamma? Okay, so this means 
This I used to denote the image of Kalman. So I make precise image because then I actually mean the path. So this would be image of gamma would be the set, which is the circle. But it doesn't take into account if I go around many times or fast or slowly or in what direction. Okay. So just as a set. So if I'm not in on this on this circle, I could be outside or inside. Okay. So um, I define. So for some point, so it doesn't have to be a circle, of course. It could be any path. Okay. Okay. So it could be something uh, like that, and A could be could be here. So then this the definition of this path, the definition is is this one over two pi i integral of gamma of one over z. Sorry, one over z minus a z. So of course here is that a was zero, a was the origin. So in general, if you have an a, you compute this integral. Okay. So this one, um, so it's called the winding number. Sometimes called index. Okay, so these are two two words that you may have may have heard. Okay, so this is the definition. Because again, if you if you compute this this kind of number, so you can do exactly the same exercise, of course, if if you take a circle not around zero but around a, then you will see that what you would get was exactly this n. And so this is what you call a winding number. And actually, this represents the number of turns that this this thing makes. Around, around the origin. <coughs> okay? Uh, excuse me, and can you get a path which is not a loop? A path which is not a loop? Uh, you mean if you can compute the winding number of, uh, of the straight line or something? Uh, or, yeah, something which is not close. I mean, so you have to be an integer, I guess, in that case. Yeah, so, I mean, if you do this, I guess it should be, it should be zero. Zero. Uh -huh. yeah. And what if, if it turns? But uh, it doesn't. Uh, that it's not close. Yeah, but okay. So yeah. So your question is if it's even defined. So I think you can. So of course you can think about these things, but the best thing is just to say that you. you I mean, it's not designed to care about these cases because clearly if you don't have a close path, then you're not going to ask how many times it, uh, it points around. So that I think is the is the best answer to um, to this. Okay, so let me make a, a claim. So a claim composition. Just some basic basic fact about this winding number that also happens to use the logarithm in its proof, which is nice. So now if I am in the following situation, okay, so I have some some gamma here, which is closed. Some path inside some u, and then I take two points, A and B. So what is the, if I compute the winding number around A and the winding number around B, what should they be in your opinion? I mean, not the actual number, but they should be the same, right? Yeah. So this is what, what you would expect. So are they, and how can we prove that they are actually the same? So of course this thing is simple to compute when you have a circle, but it's less, you cannot maybe or maybe you don't want to try to write down some parameterization of this curve because you don't know it. I just said take an abstract curve. So how can we show that the winding number is indeed the same? So the claim is that then... Sorry, I don't want to know. Is not just still an any curve? Sorry? Yeah, so if it's... Uh, so you would so I would make precise. So if you're in, inside the same connected component yeah. of this, then the winding number is the same. So if you took some more complicated uh, thing, okay, so if you take A here, B here, they might be different, no. but if you take A here and B here, no. they have to be the same. Okay, so this is what the, the statement will say. So again, you know, when you have integrals, the integrals are always additive, you know, so this is what I, I remarked a bit last time in the end. 
remember, you know, if I take the integral along this whole thing, it's the same as sort of going around here and then going around here and then going around here and then around here. So this is why often in proofs you often draw this picture, which should be interpreted as a local image. I zoomed in on this part now. Forgot the rest. Okay. Can you change the coordinates? Sorry. Changing the coordinates. No, it has nothing to do with changing the coordinates. Or you, is this your idea for the proof now? You mean? Hmm? Or was this your idea for the proof? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. So I, I will show you the, the nice idea of the proof. But just to, to see that in this, you know, in this example, so if you go around here and you compute, so if A is inside here, forget the other point for a moment, you integrate something like 1 over Z minus A. So this is not analytic everywhere inside here, because when Z is equal to A, it would blow up to infinity. So inside here, we don't know, here something interesting is happening, so I should investigate this. If I consider the integral along the rest of this curve, so as I said, it's the same as the integral along each of these closed loops individually, and then you sum them. But inside here, it is analytic. Okay, so here it is analytic. This means it's good. <laughs> okay, so it's analytic, analytic, analytic. So around these closed loops, okay, so analytic means in particular you have a primitive. Okay, so when you take the integral here, it has to be zero by example two that we have, because they are closed loops. So here we integral is 0, 0, 0, and the only non-zero contribution will come from whatever part contains A. And then it's actually going to be this winding number, by definition. And then we now work to see that if I take another point here, B, it has to be the same. Okay. If we throw the Cauchy theorem, it becomes very easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but so, as I said, so this is a step-by-step -step process. So, of course, after you know the whole course, you can often go back and say, okay, now I can use what I know at the end of the course to prove the things at the beginning in, you know, in one line. But it's one line only because you have more powerful tool. So behind, uh, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's also like in, in my research, you know. It took people uh, 200 years to, uh, you know, including me, to work up to having a certain theorem. And then you use this theorem to prove something else, which is really difficult, and you prove it in one line. Okay, like for example, the thing that, uh, you know, um, uh, so the Fields Medal was awarded only 30 years ago for an amazing proof of a statement that I can, you know, using what I know today, I can prove it as an exercise in one line. So this is sort of how mathematics works. So once you know more, you have stronger tools, stronger theorems, what was an amazing achievement 30 years ago might be completely trivial now. So giving a proof with what we know now about you know, such statements is sort of still interesting and harder. It doesn't mean that you know, it's, it's not interesting just because at the end of the course, when we know more, you know, we advance, we have more tools, this might be really easy. Okay? Sort of how mathematics works. So, how do you do this? Uh, the proof, so you look at actually um, this line. So this is it. We look at this straight line from A to B, okay? This line segment. And we will call this line segment, I will write line segment like this, AB. So now this doesn't mean the real interval AB, it means this line. So you see A, A and B could have been like this. And AB is the segment. Like this. This is what I will now, in this proof, denote by this. Okay? So, uh, consider the proof. Consider this map Z goes to Z minus A over Z minus B. I like this proof because what is this? Very good. It's a maybe strong. So you see, I have to always make use of what you learn. So this is a, a nice example of, of the where Möbius transforms come in, naturally. Okay? Um, so now, what does this map do? So this map, uh, let's connect with Z. Okay, so this F takes, uh, or maps, however you want to, to say it. So it maps this interval, so AB. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. 
this what I said was wrong. Actually, I now realize. Okay, so this is just the usual interval of, of, of numbers. Okay, the not a b. Uh, what was it? No, it's not. No, a. Okay, don't completely confused. Okay, yeah. So what does it map it to? It's a complex number. What does it map this line to? A or b? Zero to infinity. Sorry. So whole complex plane. So this, the image of this, uh, this segment here, under this map. Zero, okay. So we take this map. So if we take in, yeah. So we take in A. Yeah, so, or is it infinity or minus infinity? I just have to check. So B. Yeah. Okay, so I guess what we're doing. Okay, so I guess in this proof, when I wrote it down, I somehow assumed that this thing was um, somehow on the real line or something like that. Okay, so um, how do I want to do this? Okay, so assume, let me put it this way. So for all this to make sense, let's assume for without loss of generality that we have this. This is the situation, okay? So without loss of generality, we can sort of move this curve. So I mean, we can always rotate the complex plane so that these lie on the real line. So I realize that now this is what I did, right? In the proof. So this is not really a, a big deal. If I have such a curve and I have it there, and the curve lies like this, mm -hmm. I can just yeah. move the whole picture, okay? And it will not change anything about this theorem. And this was just for me to write it more conveniently, so that because I wanted to fit with the 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 picture the picture that we had, so this goes to minus uh, infinity to zero. Okay, is this true now? Because now b is greater than a. I'm assuming something like this. So b minus no plus infinity. Okay, so maybe I wanted it to be Who wrote these notes? <laughs> okay. So okay, zero plus infinity. Zero. Sorry? Minus infinity. Is it minus infinity? B minus A. A minus B. Uh, okay, so if I was in uh, in B. Yes, yes, minus. Minus bin. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So the person who wrote this note, okay, he was thinking. <laughs> okay. Minus infinity zero. Okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You write these notes and then you come here early in the morning and you don't know anymore what you're doing. But <laughs> okay. So what what are we saying? So it maps this to, to minus infinity. So you have this domain, okay? Uh, like this. You had A and B, you map this line to, okay, so you have this thing, okay, and you map this to, now it became this, right? So it maps the composite. So, I mean, let's forget, we just look, let's forget where this gamma is, it just maps everything to, maps the complex plane to, when I remove these two, to this. Okay, and then we can map this using the using the logarithm, or using the principal branch of the logarithm, we can map this to all of C. Okay? So what we get is that this log of z minus a over z minus b. How it maps a b to minus infinity to Sorry? I did not get how it maps a b to minus Ah, b. yes. So uh, it's because when a is very close to b, mm -hmm. so you see when it is equal to b, then we see that we'll have some problem here. But will it be sort of minus infinity or plus infinity? Okay, so we see that if a is very close to b, mm -hmm. it comes from below, so that this thing is negative. Okay, so it's it's negative and approaching zero from below. So this is something very small, negative, and this is positive. So when it blows up in absolute value, it will go to minus infinity. Okay, so this is not, 
yeah, this is not complex analysis. This is just, uh, you know, real analysis. Uh, something. So, how to explain this? So, when, uh, when Z goes to B, okay, so Z is equal to actually B minus, B minus epsilon because it goes from below for some positive epsilon. Then this thing is equal to B minus epsilon minus A over B minus epsilon minus B, mm -hmm. which is equal to B minus A minus epsilon over minus epsilon. Okay? Mm -hmm. This thing is positive. Mm -hmm. This thing is positive. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we have minus something positive, epsilon goes to zero. Okay. Yeah, that was nicely pointed out by, by the, the audience here. So, okay, very good. So, what I want to say is this function. This is actually... Uh, holomorphic. In the complex plane, if you remove AB. If you remove this. So, this is the claim. And if it's holomorphic, then... Let me show you how you can disappear. So if it's holomorphic, it means that in particular we can we can differentiate it, right? The definition. And then what would be the the differential? So this is equal to if you want I can write that. So this is equal to log of z minus a minus log of z minus b prime. Okay. It's equal to 1 over z minus a minus 1 over z minus b. Okay? Yes. So, what does this imply? This implies the following. So, what I want to compute is, is this thing, right? So, dz over z minus a, and I want to compare it to uh, to dz over z minus b. Okay, this was the winding number around a. This was the winding number around b. So this thing is actually equal to this uh, log uh, so yeah, no, but so um, so this is the integral of log prime, right? So it's equal to log of of these things. Okay. So it's equal to log of uh, this. Uh, so let's say gamma. Of, so my parameterization was where. This is all I have to. All I have to. All I have to remember. So my parameterization of this of this curve. Yeah. Well, this doesn't matter. So. A gamma of one, I think it was in one, or a gamma of one and b, okay, minus log of gamma of zero minus a over gamma of zero minus b, okay. But this is equal to because gamma of zero was equal to gamma of one because this is a closed curve, okay. So gamma has just to do with this curve, right? It's, it's gamma. And it starts in gamma of zero and ends in the same point gamma of one. Okay. So this is equal. So this was just by the fact that it had a primitive. The primitive was log. So this is equal to just the value in one. This is the value zero. So this is equal to in fact zero. And this being zero means that this integral is equal to this integral. So the winding numbers are the same. And we have proven this thing. So this. Follows. Okay, uh, yeah, bit messy there. Sorry about that. So let's go through it again. So, of course, all this business here was to say that this function here is holomorphic if you remove this line. Okay? And why is that? Well, it's because if we start here, we know that this is a well-defined holomorphic function. Okay? So all we have to check is that if we take this function and look on these values, then 
when you compose it, first you go from all the upper values away from this line, you go somewhere, and this somewhere has to be not on this line. So this is why we look to say that, okay, this line maps exactly on this, so if we are outside here, we're going to avoid that line, and so we're going to be able to write this down in a way defined way. This is what this is. So this is well defined and holomorphic on C away from, from its line. And so you have an antiderivative away from this, from this cut here. You have this antiderivative. And then you can use this principle that I had in the example 2 from earlier this morning, which just said that, okay, this is the derivative of log, so these things are just equal to log evaluated in the endpoints of the curve. And since the curve was closed, this must be zero. And hence, this whole the winding number is, is independent, uh, independent of these things. OK. So here are some, uh, some facts about winding numbers. Quick facts, not a very complete list. Okay, but so such a winding number for a closed curve is always an integer. Okay, and if I take the winding number, sorry, I can place it here. So if I take the winding number around minus gamma, around a point, so minus gamma means now I go in the other direction. So it's equal to minus m of gamma a. So now remember I was confused about whether my definition actually counted clockwise or counterclockwise because I thought it should, from memory I thought it should count actually clockwise, but it seems it does count counterclockwise. Anyway, when you change the direction, it's the opposite one. And whatever I was confused about is convention, which is not really, I mean, there's nothing essential about it, it's just what should be our standard choice. But each choice really is, is the same. Okay, so if you change direction, it changes sign, and this maybe is the, so this is what we just proved, that n of gamma a is constant on the connected, or in fact path connected, components uh, of C minus the image of gamma. Okay, this is defined equal to. So this is exactly the picture that I drew. This third one is exactly this picture I drew. Okay, but it's constant on each of these things, and also on the outside one, by the way. There's also an outside component. Okay, so it means it's constant. On so it's an integer. When you change the direction of the curve, then the number changes to minus whatever we had. And it's constant on, on this. Okay. Now, where have we gotten to? Now we have gotten to Cauchy theorem. Okay, so now Cauchy's. Theorem uh, for this. So this is way, the way that this theory is, is constructed. So Cauchy's theorem is the theorem that says that if you integrate along a closed path, then the integral, and if you integrate an analytic function along a closed path, then the integral must be zero. Okay, so everybody has heard this result many times, but what about the proof? So how do we prove these statements? So historically, it was always about, for, about how you choose this closed path, or this closed curve. So the first proofs were, about, uh, were a bit like this. Assume that the closed curve was a rectangle, or a disk, or, you know, or I mean something, something simple, a triangle. Assume this, then we try to find a proof of a theorem, and then we try to adapt it to more and more general statements Later, okay? So now it's Cauchy's theorem for a disk. This is a sort of intermediate uh, stage of the Cauchy's theorem that we're going to dive into. So it's, uh, it's much more general than the rectangle uh, 
quick time things, we will see now. So I will write down the statement. So, because it deals with any closed path, so gamma can be any closed path inside um, the disk, okay, which is the open unit disk, okay. This is D. So F is holomorphic on D. Then the integral along gamma of f of d is equal to zero. Okay? So this is a fairly general statement. You'll see, uh, you'll see in a bit after this proof what is the, the most general statement of, of Cauchy's theorem. Okay? But for a moment, let's assume we have this. And why is this not the completely general one when it's, for example, such things that it's not like in the one over z case where it was analytic except in a point, you know. Here it, we know at least that it's analytic in all of the disk. There are no points inside the disk where it's not analytic that the curve could go around or, or mess about, okay? So this is why this, this theorem is at least not the full, full general statement. But it's, it's quite good in generality, okay? So the statement, what I'm saying is that this thing is simply connected. Okay, so this is why it's not the full general one. So proof, the proof is, is very enlightening. So we should do, all the proofs are essentially variants of the same thing. So once you know one, you know kind of all of the proofs. So we will try to do this in detail, how you, how you prove it. So the idea is to approximate gamma, so gamma is now our, our first curve. Okay, so this is gamma. And I like curves going clockwise. So I approximate gamma. So this is inside the disk. The disk is around it. Everywhere it's analytic, in every point inside and outside the curve. So I approximate gamma by a polygon, or by a polygon small path. Okay. So now we have to draw a good picture. Well, the chance to, to draw a good picture. So you have this gamma, and then you approximate it by a polygon. So you approximate it like this. So you will take regular points. So of course, this is parameterized by time. So you subdivide the time interval, 0, 1, into a certain number of, of parts, and then you make it more and more parts, and then you just take the polygon that goes along these points. Okay, so we'll do something like this. So you approximate it by this. So now all of these have straight edges, right? So this is a point. So you approximate it by this path. And of course, when you, when you choose this distance between the points where you just take the straight line between these, when you choose this distance smaller and smaller, this will eventually approximate the integral. So then you will get so this polygonal path is P. Okay? Then the integral along P uh, of this f of z dz will converge to the integral along gamma of of dz as I subdivide this, this path into finer and finer pieces. Okay, um, so this is by refining by refining the partition. Uh, yes? Uh, why is it always possible to approximate uh, any path with uh, such kind of poly polygon? So what I'm saying is that you have gamma that goes from an interval, which we can assume is 0, 1. So not all the intervals are the same. So 0, 1 into, into the disk, like this. And then you subdivide 0, 1 into, into pieces. Okay? So you have 
zero. Uh, here is zero. Here is one. And when you take t1, t2, t3, t4, etc., into tn. Okay, and when you take, you look at, um, you look at gamma of t. Okay, let me erase and continue the next part. Yeah, when you look at gamma of t, t1, t2, etc. Okay, and these would be so these are with regular intervals, right? So for example, uh, t k could be. Uh, 1 over k, for example. Okay. So you just. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe in the other direction. 1 over 1 over k or something. Let's be. It's something like that. And then you take gamma of tk. So then you get all these points. Okay. And then you have a number of points in the plane. And you can draw straight lines. Okay. So it's completely constructed, so you can see this, this can happen. And the fact that it has to approximate, it just has to do with the fact that this path, it has some regularity, the path is continuous, so when these tk get very close to each other, the gamma of tk also get close to each other. And you can see that it's kind of an approximation. Say? How many convergent of that? Just like uniform convergence of parameterization, or so there is no convergence of. Oh, you mean that this path P converges to gamma? Yeah. So I'm not necessarily saying anything about convergence of paths. It's just everything. I'm just saying convergence of integrals. Okay. Yeah. So these numbers have to. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not giving you any theory about convergence of paths or triangles or something. Like that. Okay. So I'm just doing this. So then the claim is that it is enough to prove uh, that integral of p is equal to zero. And this will actually be true always. So even if I have a super bad approximation with just uh, three points okay, on this curve, then the integral will, will be zero. And then I refine it, and it will be zero, 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 always zero. However, I refine it, so also for this limit, it will have to be have to be zero. Uh, okay, uh, and in fact, so in fact, enough to prove for the triangle. Length by recurrence. Sorry? Then it will be built by recurrence. Uh, yeah, so by recurrence, so I'm not exactly sure if you mean the direction, but you could, it's possible. Uh, so what it means is that, okay, so this is a path inside the, uh, the circle, so there is some origin here, okay? And then you look at these triangles that go like this, okay? And you go like that, like that, like that. And so on. So now, of course, this is a, a messy picture. So I could draw a sort of simpler picture. Let me take a, a slightly simpler polygon. I'm just taking something randomly now. Okay. So I have this point zero. Okay. And then you subdivide it like this. And okay. you are interested in the outside curve. Can do and what I'm saying now is that if you integrate along all of these, uh, all of these uh, triangles, so let's call this, you know, delta one, delta two, delta three, delta four, delta five, delta because it looks like a triangle, so it's a natural notation. Okay. So what I'm saying is that um, if I sum these, I want to claim that the integral of p of f of z to z equal to the sum over i into the delta i f of z dz. I want to play this. So how do we see this? So this is a very standard uh, point, but it's very important to be able to understand these things. And it has to do with the fact that when I go around the triangle in one direction, 
So if I go along this segment here, and I integrate in this direction, and then I integrate in the other direction, then I have undone what I did. So nothing has happened. Okay? So this is what happens. So when I integrate, so now let's see, what I want is going around like this. And I want the contribution of the integrals here. Now let's see what happens if I, let's say I start here, and I integrate in turn around all of the triangles, and add them up. And it's important that I always keep the same orientation, so I always keep it uh, clockwise. Okay? Doesn't matter if I keep it always counterclockwise, always clockwise, but now let's say I always keep clockwise. So let's choose it. So then I go here, clockwise. So now let me make a, make a mark, because I visited this one clockwise once. Okay? So clockwise is orange, counterclockwise is green. So I visited it clockwise once. Now I go here, clockwise, so I visited it clockwise once, okay? Now I go here, clockwise, I visited this one clockwise once. Then I take the next triangle, okay, so now I, I was done with this triangle, clockwise. I take the next one, I go like this. So I visit this one clockwise once, I visit this one clockwise once, and now this one, let's say, I mean now I'm Okay, so this token, but now I'm undoing, you see, I went in this direction, and now I'm going in the other direction, you see? Okay, so let me do it this way. So now I've gone up, and then I'm going down. Let's say that this is what it means, right? So I went like this, now I go like this. So now the contribution of this would have been nothing. Okay, and then I take the next triangle, I go here once, I go up here, then I go down here. So I go in the opposite direction. The contribution was cancelled. Then I take the next one, I go here once, this is okay. Then I go up, then I go down here, so the contribution was cancelled. Then I go here, then I go up here. Last time I went down here, remember? So now I go up, so contribution is cancelled. And last time you see I went up here, now I go down here, contribution was cancelled. And so actually all the contributions from the interior point have now been cancelled because I went up exactly once and down exactly once. I mean, but once in each direction. Okay? So this is a very typical trick in complex analysis. So actually when I look at these triangles and integrate along these, when I sum all of the triangles, what I get is just this outer part, because here I just went in one direction and I never went in the other, the way that I went around. Okay, this is very important. Is this clear? What has happened? So of course, I only had to choose my partitioning so that exactly, so every triangle so every side was exactly in two triangles, because that way I, I could do it. Had to be in an even number of, of triangles. Okay, so I have this. So since I have this, of course, if I can show that for a triangle, this is zero, and the sum of zero will be zero, so all these polygonal paths would be zero, and then by approximation I would have shown it for, for any path. Okay, so here, um, yeah, so what I did was to, to subdivide um, these things and take this up. So, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so now we show the one. So now show. that the integral along such a triangle is zero. And this is what is called, so this is the second part of the idea of the proof. So this is now very close to what I told you that the people did in the beginning. We looked at rectangles, we looked at triangles, and so on. And what was the idea? And so, Gubsa, and this is O-U-R, S-A-T, so he had a, a very nice idea of an elementary proof of how you can prove that the integral along a triangle of an analytic function has to be has to be zero. And he also did it along a, a rectangle. And this is a common technique, so let's try to, to remember it. So the proof is by bisection. So this is the name of the method, the proof by bisection. So you have a triangle, okay? This is the triangle. And then you 
So bisecting means you divide exactly in two equally large fractions. That doesn't mean that you divide in two parts. Actually, you divide in equally large parts. So you take every side and you divide it in two, but in the middle. Okay. So of course you can do this. Divide it in two in the middle. Okay, like that. And then you connect these sides. And it makes a subdivision into four triangles, yeah. where each, so the uh, perimeter, so the length of the, the sides of, this, of these triangles are exactly half of the perimeter of what was before, right? Because I divided every, every side in two. Okay, so anyway, so I write this triangle, my original triangle, I write it as delta 1 tilde union delta 2, delta 3, up to delta 4 tilde. So I write it as a union of four, four triangles, bisecting the, the sides, okay? So this is, if this was A, then this is one half of this side, one half, okay, and so on. So I'm bisecting. And then we will make this uh, construction where we, we do this over and over again, a number of times. Okay, so now I can pick, so then you can pick delta 1 is equal to some delta tilde to the i, where i is now from 1, 2, it's 1, 2, 3, or 4, okay? So you can pick one of these triangles, where the integral is the, the largest, so to speak, um, such that the integral of along this triangle, along the original triangle, is less than or equal to 4 times the absolute value of the integral along delta 1 of f of d dz. Okay, so by the way, so of course now I have that this integral, the original integral, dz is equal to the sum over the, the integrals over the delta tilde i f of d dz. Okay, from i equal 1 to 4. So this was the point. So exactly as I explained here, you have the same argument that works here. So if you sum along each of these triangles, then you get the integral along the whole time. Okay, and then you can choose one that satisfies this. So why is that? So what I'm saying is that I have four, uh, four integrals that adds up to the original one. So at least one of them has to be as big as the average value they have to have. That's what I'm saying. Okay? So this is, this is a trivial argument. So repeat process. For delta 1. Okay? So what you do is that, so you find this triangle, and let's say it was this one. Then you divide this into parts. Then you come continue again, let's say it was the middle one this time, okay, so then you can get this, and then let's say it was the top one, okay, so then you get subdivide these, and you get something like that, and then you continue and you subdivide, and eventually it will converge to some point, some point. and this is the idea. So you keep the process for delta 1, so you get a sequence, uh, delta was the delta 0 1, and then you get delta 1, delta 2, okay, etc. So smaller and smaller triangles, whereby in action you can show that, well, you always choose it this way, right? So you see that the absolute value of f of b dz is less than or equal to 4 to the n of absolute value along delta n of f of z dz. So you get, get this. And what do we need to show? 
Now let's think for a bit. What do we need to show in order to prove it? We want to show that this was zero. So we have to show that somehow, so this 4 to the n, so we want to make n very large. So n very large means that we subdivide more and more. So then 4 to the n obviously becomes very large, and this clearly becomes quite small because we integrate along smaller and smaller triangles, but we have to show that it becomes small sufficiently fast so that it compensates for 4 to the n becoming larger and larger, and this whole thing together should actually go to 0. So this is what we need to show. And this is where we will now use, I mean, so far we didn't use anything about this function being analytic. This I could do for any function, right? So I have to use the condition that it's analytic somewhere and somehow. Okay, so I should just uh, write down all the way. Okay, so moreover, Okay, so by induction, this diameter of, of the triangle, delta n, so it's kept exactly in half, okay? In every step, you kept it in half. So it's 2 to the minus n of diameter of delta, or delta 0. And the same thing with the perimeter. 2 to the minus n of the perimeter of delta 0. Okay, and most importantly, if you look at the uh, intersection of all these delta n's over infinite number, okay, then this is equal to what? So each such delta n is actually a closed set, right? So the intersection of all these closed sets is going to be closed. It's going to be a point. It's going to be a point. Okay, so you can show it's a point, and now we use this. So f is holomorphic at every point inside the disk where this pair lives, but in particular it's holomorphic at z0. Okay, so in particular. Okay, and so this means that this limit as z goes to z0 of f of z minus f of z0 over z minus z0 exists and equals f prime of z0. In particular, it exists. Okay. Maybe you can close the door. Okay. So this. Thank you. So this exists, and this is, of course, what we think of as H, right? These are just two, two different ways of writing this. So now we take N, this uh, natural number, such that, such that this, uh, this is closed. So such that, uh, such that for any N, for any Z in delta N, so of course this means that this converges to this, which means that for any z sufficiently close to z0, this is small. So another way to say this is that for any n sufficiently large, delta n comes, becomes a smaller and smaller neighborhood of z0, right? So for any z in delta n in this small neighborhood, we get that this uh, f of v minus f of z0, z minus z0, minus f prime of z0 is uh, less than epsilon. Okay? Because this is, so for every z in such a small neighborhood, for delta n, large enough. Okay, we have this. And now again, so we can write So we can write f of z is equal to f of z0 plus z minus z0 times f prime um, of z0 plus some remainder term, right? So we're plus, I will write it this way, z minus z0 times, times r of z, 
which is the remainder where R of V is its absolute value is less than epsilon. Um, okay, so assuming that we have this, so of course this is just some kind of expansion of the function, right? I mean, this is this is quite interesting. So what do you get? So you get that the integral on delta n using this epsilon that we have chosen. So this integral is equal to first of all the integral along delta n of of this first part here. Okay. Plus the integral, so I'll just write them separately. Okay, and now what can we say about these things? What can we say about the integral of this on delta n? It's zero. It's zero. And why is it zero? Because this, this map has a primitive. Yeah, exactly. Because this is a constant, and a constant has a primitive. Okay? And this is just a, a linear function, and this has a primitive. So linear function times something like this. So these have, have primitive. So this is equal to zero. Very good. So this whole thing is equal to zero because uh, one and v are primitives, okay? And of course, f prime of the zero is, is actually just a number. Yeah. So one and v are primitives. So this is right, and then we get this last part. Now, what can we do with the last part? So we can try to. To estimate it, we can try to use that this absolute value of R of Z is less than epsilon. Okay? So we can try to uh, so so we have to have to estimate this. So it remains to estimate that so if we recap this absolute value of this function on delta n, so this is less than or equal to the integral so the absolute value of this integral, but which is less than or equal to you can move the absolute values inside. This is very good to know. Very important to know. So that's going to be equal to Okay, actually, maybe since this is the first time I do this, let me just write this out properly. I'm sorry. I will so z minus z zero R V V Z. And then what happens when you move it inside? So this is where uh, and then one second off. So what you get is you can take the absolute value of all of these things. And this is one thing that people sometimes forget. You take the absolute value also of dz. Of the area of uh, What does this mean? It means that you forget about the orientation and it becomes just the length of the curve. <coughs> So if it went in one direction and then it went back, then dz would recognize that it went back, but absolute value of dz would not. So when you take the integral of absolute value of dz along some curve, it's the, it's the, the length of, of the curve. I mean, this you, you know. This is how you should think about it. So this is less than or equal to, now this is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay? This is less than or equal to epsilon integral along delta n of this thing, dz. Okay, but absolute value of z minus z0, what is this? If we just do some trivial estimate, so z is now where? Sorry? Yeah, so z is in delta n. So z0 is somewhere, z0 is somewhere in here, and z is also in here. So in particular, we could say that this is less than or equal to the diameter of delta n. These are by far not, you know, we're not trying to make some optimal uh, clever thing, we're just trying to do a trivial estimate, okay? Because anyway, this epsilon will, will give us kind of what we want if we do just a good enough estimate here. Okay? So this is less than or equal to epsilon diameter of delta n times the integral of delta n of dz 
And now this integral is just the length of the sides of delta n. So this is the perimeter. Okay? So this is equal to this times the perimeter of delta n. Okay, so this is what it means. And now you remember this. So let me uh, let me continue here. So this is equal to uh, epsilon times four to the minus n, right? Two to the minus n times two to the minus n. So four to the minus n diameter delta zero times perimeter delta zero by what is written just up here. Okay. So uh, this is what is equal to. Okay, so now we have this estimate. Now we just have to remember uh, what we had in the end. Okay, so we have to remember the estimate that we had. So, in conclusion, the absolute value of delta f of z is z. We had this, right? It was less than or equal to 4 times n absolute value of z and f of z z, which is then less than or equal to 4 to n epsilon 4 to the minus n diameter of delta zero perimeter of delta zero, the original triangle. And now we got exactly what I said we wanted. We said that this integral here goes to zero faster than, I mean, fast enough to compensate for this one going to infinity. So these ones cancel. Okay, and then this one goes to zero. As epsilon goes to zero, which means that this integral is in fact equal to zero. Because this estimate has to hold for every epsilon. Okay? So this was the kind of magical proof by Gulsa. I'm not claiming that this is a particularly natural idea to do, but I mean it's not very clear why it should give you anything at all to just start subdividing this uh, triangle into smaller and smaller pieces and then somehow magically this gives you a proof that it has to be zero because if you just put, if you just do this for any function it's not like okay the integral along this smaller and smaller piece will get smaller and smaller but it's not like that means the integral of the whole thing has to be zero so it's kind of a miraculous idea uh, in, in my opinion that this actually works Okay, but, uh, but it does, and it's, uh, it's a common method. It's also by far the most elementary method to, to prove it. So it's, it is a nice one. Okay, any quick questions about the proof now? So I think it's the, the kind of proof that has to be digested a little bit. Like why did this work? You know, somehow magically we divide this into smaller and smaller pieces and then everything fits. Some proofs are like that. Um, you don't really know why they did fit in the end, uh, even though you can see that they, they clearly did. Okay, but this idea by, you know, this is a very common idea, I think you should definitely remember, that we started with a curve and we approximated it by polygons, and then we said it was enough for a triangle because we can do this thing going around triangles in opposite directions, it cancels out, and so we can deal from any curve complicated, we can deal with just a triangle which is, I mean, a great simplification. And thanks to this, we could look at the triangle and try to find some clever way of showing the integral has to be zero. Now, without the first idea that it was enough with the triangle, it would have been a completely different business. Okay, so now I want to formulate... So I said this was not the most general statement of, of Cauchy's theorem. This was Cauchy's theorem for the disk that we have now proved. So now I want to state the most general, um, general thing. So definition. So if gamma is a closed path in some open, uh, open neighborhood, in C is uh, said to be homologous. to zero, okay, and we write 
Gama, pomalu je zkusil, jo? Když se nám je, the winding number um, around some point A, so if this is zero for all A, well, not in, in U. Okay, so this is what it means to be uh, to be homologous to zero. And so this was part one. In part two, you will see what this is related to. So a open set, so an open connected set, is said to be simply connected. So first I think most of you know already what it means to be simply connected from topology. Intuitively it means you don't have a hole, right? This is the usual formulation. But, you know, uh, raise the, as a caveat. So if and only if every closed half, gamma in U, is homologous to zero in U. So this is what it means to be simply connected. Example, okay, so a disk of radius r, is, is it simply connected or not? Yeah. Okay, so it is simply connected. Okay, why is it simply connected? Why is it simply connected? So let's check why is it simply connected. So we have to check this definition. So if I take any path, any closed path inside the disk. So this is now the radius r, the disk center to zero. Okay? So I take any path inside, any closed path, okay. Okay. any closed path, it should be homologous to zero. So what does that mean? It means that for any A which is not inside this, uh, this open set U, this should be should be zero. Okay, so that means that if I take an A which is outside, uh, outside here. Okay, so when I look at one over z minus A, and it is holomorphic inside this thing. So if I integrate along gamma, this thing has to be zero because it is holomorphic inside. So actually. You know, we're used to saying, ah, the disk is simply connected because, you know, it has no hole. But actually, you know, if you want to be rigorous here, and I'll show you in a while why you have to be rigorous, this is actually by Cushing's theorem that we are used here. Or a version of, of Cushing's theorem or this exercise that we have, okay? By exercise or Cushing's theorem, whichever. Now I wrote Cushing because I, I said to Cushing. Okay, uh, another example. So now if I take uh, this domain, the complex plane, but I take away two points, 0 and 1. Okay, so now what are... Um, ah, sorry, I had another example first. Yeah, so something that is not simply connected, I wanted to say. So, okay, so what is the most natural example? It's I remove one point, right? This is not simply connected. Yeah. And why is that? A circle around zero. Yeah. A equal to zero. Exactly. So gamma t is equal to e to the, to the it. Uh, so t. 0 to pi is uh, not homologous to 0. Okay? Now, to the point I wanted to make. So if I take u to be c minus 2 points, because of course the thing that you have in mind is that uh, homologous to 0, it means that, you know, if I took this domain and I took away a point, 
you have in mind that not to move to zero is something like this, because the point is inside. And to move to zero would be something like this, because there is no point inside. But there are more complicated situations. Okay? So this is what I want to show. The warning is if I take away two points from a complex plane, take away 0 and 1, if I change that, then, you know, okay, if I take a circle here, it's not simply connected. I mean, this is not homologous to 0, this is not homologous to 0. If I take something over here, it is homologous to 0. But I can actually do something that goes around these points and that is still homologous to 0. It is actually the so called, however you pronounce it, Pokamel path. So it's the path that goes like this. It goes like that, like that, then it goes like this, and then it goes back up. Okay, so it goes in this direction. So it goes like so, and then it comes back up. So this is the path. So this one is homologous to zero. Okay, so here we have uh, this one is equal to the other one, and they are both equal to zero. If you count it, because you see they go around in one direction yeah, and once, and then when it comes back, it also goes around in the other direction. So you can actually compute this. So um, here, gamma is in fact homologous to zero. Okay, so this is just to show you that this can happen. Um, so it is slightly more complicated than you might think. This this be like being homologous to zero or not? Okay. And now let's take the general form of Cauchy's theorem. general form of Cauchy's theorem, okay, so it is the following, that if gamma is a closed path, which is cohomologous to, to zero, in some u, f is holomorphic in u, then this integral of f of v is equal to zero. So the general statement is that if you have f which is holomorphic in a domain and you integrate uh, along a closed curve, so if I write this and talk about being homologous to zero, it means that my path is implicitly closed. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a closed path I consider. And if it is homologous to zero, such as this one, then actually the integral is zero. So the integral along this path is zero, if I have an analytic function in the domain u equals c minus these two points. Okay? If I have an analytic function in this, then it has to be zero. This is the general form of, uh, of Cauchy's, Cauchy's theorem. Okay, and then this will also lead to Cauchy's integral formula and to all these theorems will come, they will fall like dominoes after we have proved this. So you will get Cauchy's integral formula, then you will get the higher derivatives, you will get that uh, the holomorphic functions have a power series expansion, you will get Moveira's theorem, you will get Liouville, you will get Cauchy's estimate, you will get all these things as, you know, now coming very quickly once we're at this point. So I think next time I will have time to cover most of, most of all these things. But uh, now the time is up for, for today. Do you have any questions?